We'll talk about the genesis of the book and we'll talk about your other writing experience in time, but I'm sure for our audience it would be most interesting if we could dive straight into the subject matter, if that's okay with you. It's something which you've immersed yourself in for quite a considerable time and, and spoken to uh, some really fabulous experts around the world. And I, I guess the first question, just, just to check in, um, can you give us after your uh, inquiry what your definition of an emotion is? That's, that's a great question, and I, I, I'd love to give you a great answer. Let me start, though, <laughs> by saying that even in the field of emotion research, that's still one of the questions that's being debated, and people use different definitions of emotion. The, uh, the one that's uh, pretty widely used that I like the best is uh, the definition of an emotion as a functional state of the brain, and I think that takes a little unpacking, so I'll, I'll do that. Uh, I'll say it again. So it's a functional state of the brain. Functional state of the brain. Each emotion is a different functional state of the brain, and it's, each emotion is a different functional state that is appropriate to a certain type of situation that is what stimulates the emotion. So your brain is an information processor. It's not like the computers that we use. It's a lot, it's a lot different. It's a little more like the uh, newer types of computers or computer programming that people are doing with the so-called neural nets and deep learning, but it's even much more complicated than that, but it doesn't really matter uh, if it's like the, the electronic computers, it is a, a computer, it processes information. And so what your brain has built in are certain rules of logic, such as if A implies B and B implies C, then A implies C. And so we, we're blessed to have certain rules like that in, in our brains and we have a rational logical capacity. But what our brains do for us is that they take in data, uh, sensory data from your eyes, your ears, and your, and your other senses, and they understand the circumstances that you're in, and, and your brain is there to make decisions. And the decisions could be either literally a decision, or it could be a thought. Your brain generates a thought, or it could generate a behavior. Or it could make your heart race faster. It could make you run away. It could make you say hello. Whatever it is, your brain takes in the data and, uh, uh, that's coming in and the knowledge of the situation and generates an output. And in doing that, it doesn't do that in the vacuum. It does that in the context of your knowledge base, your memories, your past experiences, your beliefs, your goals. There's a lot more that feeds into all that calculation than just the sensory data. And that's where the emotions come in. So uh, the, the emotions uh, tune your brain in a way that, it, that, that when it's looking at and, and, and taking into account these memories and other things, each bit of information that it's taking into account from your past, from your beliefs, your experience, your goals, and so forth, has to be evaluated. Is it relevant? How important is it? How trustworthy is it? Uh, should I be skeptical of it? Uh, and so all those different pieces of information that are available to you as you're starting your processing and doing your mental processing have to be evaluated and the way they're evaluated and, and valued is very strongly dependent on your emotion state. So when we say that an emotion is a functional state of the brain, it means that those uh, elements that are going to be fed into this processing that's going on are dependent on your emotion state. And let me just say that this description I just gave illustrates why I say in the book that it's very important that there's no rational mind that's separate from a emotional mind. There's no rational thought that happens without the emotion because these, these beliefs, knowledge, and so forth that affect your mental calculations are always there. And so there's some emotion, some emotion state that's, that's determining how they're used. And that always works together with your rational mind to, to give you your, your final uh, output. It's, it's interesting, your very first remark that it's that the question of what an emotion is is not well understood or at least not well agreed within the field is very interesting. And we can contrast that, can't we, with, with other bits, let's say, of biology where, um, you know, if you think about respiration, right? I mean, so respiration, the bit where we take air in and out of our lungs and there are these gases and they get transferred across the membrane into our blood and, and the concentrations of them change and there are various disorders. That's a, a biological system which is, which is well understood. You wouldn't say if you were writing a book about respiration, I'd say, what's breathing? You'd say, well, Dan, you know, it's a great question. A lot of people have, you know, debated. And so the first point to make here, I guess, is that with neuroscience, we are 
as a biological field of study in a very different place than we are with uh, with most kinds of biology. And indeed, perhaps as one might say in terms of the study of gravity, I mean, there are some abstract or finer points of gravity which are disputed, but basically it makes things, you know, fall, it's attraction, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, do, were you, uh, uh, I don't know, were you disappointed to find that the scientists, the neuroscientists you were speaking to hadn't got further ahead with the problem? <laughs> First, well, no, not at all. I mean, one of the exciting parts of uh, th aspects of writing the book was that it is a field that's undergoing a revolution and, and, and new information and discoveries are made every day. So that was part of the excitement and also part of the reason I thought there was, there was room for such a book. On the other hand, the flip side of that is, yes, it was a bit, made it a bit hard at times that people aren't using the same definitions and not just for emotion. I got terribly confused at some point because I, thought I knew a fair amount of brain anatomy and I'm reading the, I'm reading all these research papers and I'm finding what seem to be contradictions and and I realized then that that even the the, the parts of the brain sometimes are not agreed upon uh, the the anatomy or the names uh, some people include this part and that part or have a separate name for this and others don't they include it in that and so forth and that's all still being worked out uh, the brain is very So let's get back to the central question then, as you said. Um, uh, and I do think this kind of dichotomy piece um, is really interesting. Y you talk about Plato's view of the mind early in your book. And I just wonder for those of us that are maybe a bit rusty on our Plato, uh, can, can, you, can you give us the description, that the chariot description that he brings? Because I think it's, it's going to be interesting to understand your central point and also to answer the question you know what's new so so what was plato's sense of of how well, the plato mind like in the, the uh system of our of our brain our, our mind as a, a charioteer that's rational thought that has two horses that it has to control or we're actually not so much control as i think work with harmoniously uh, and one is what we would today call your emotions or your feelings and the other are our drives uh, lusts and so forth. Uh, so one would be maybe the emotions where you have love and satisfaction by accomplishing something and the other are more primal drives. And this all works together to create your, your, the products of your mind. And that was very influential and got used, but adapted and, and changed through the ages by different philosophers, each of whom <laughs> seems to have his his own or her own uh, different theory of what emotions or the passions they used to call them or what they are. And it really didn't become an object of scientific study in a major way until, until Charles Darwin attacked the problem. What was Darwin's take on it? Because I mean, obviously he was a, we would say he was a naturalist, although of course he wrote about humans as well, but, but what was the order that he brought to the problem uh, as contrasting with what came before? Well, Darwin, uh, who was obviously brilliant, was interested uh, later in his life in, in how uh, the idea of emotions fits into his theory of evolution. So the questions that concern him were, why did we evolve, why did we develop and what's the relationship between emotions and animals and, and in humans? And why do we even have them? How did they evolve? What purpose do they serve? And he, he was a very, if you ever studied Darwin's life, he was a very meticulous man and he, when he went into something, he, he left no detail un, 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 uncharted. And he examined all sorts of animals that he could find uh, in the different zoos and even other cultures around the world. And he sent away things to get to, to, for people to study and sent back to him about other cultures. And he made quite a, an analysis. And his conclusion was that in animals, uh, emotions have really two roles. One is to enable a quick response to a uh, dangerous or um, threatening or important situation that they encounter. And the other was to communicate to other of its species something that's important to communicate. For example, uh, if you're having a conflict and you show a fierce anger, that may be enough to, to preclude a fight because the other animal realizes that you're really more determined than it is or so forth. Uh, so it's a, or to communicate that, hey, there's a predator in the, in the environment. And, and, and so you would, the animals would have certain vocal and facial expressions that would communicate in that way. And they'd have certain pre-ordained behavior that would uh, come as a result of a trigger of seeing a predator or 
falling off a rock or whatever it was that caused the uh, trigger the emotion. Now, in people, Darwin said, hmm, interesting, we have language, so we don't need to communicate by making faces and or, or showing our emotions because we can tell each other about our emotions, uh, you know. So, and and uh, secondly, um, we have rational thinking. And so we don't need emotions to make our decisions for us. And so Darwin thought that emotions in, in humans were more of a vestige like the appendix and they weren't really necessary. And, and, and Darwin felt that Rational Arguably, thinking. this is a Victorian male perspective, perhaps. Yeah, <laughs> and a very things. male perspective. And 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 Darwin felt that uh, the rational, and, and and I think most scholars since Newton felt that the rational reasoning and rational mind is the is the uh, the ultimate and is uh, the superior way of making all decisions. And this theory of Darwin's got, it got, it got elaborated upon over the next decades as people started to study the brain. And so added to that theory was uh, the idea that there are certain brain centers of the brain for this and for that. So you may have a love center, a fear center, et cetera. Just, so just that, before we get to the, to the neuroanatomy piece though, just back with Darwin, was it right that he identified or claimed that there was a, a limited, quite a small number of emotions, which so were characteristic he, of humans and also other animals is that right right so he named six uh, basic emotions uh, fear anger sadness happiness disgust and surprise and and they to darwin they were all distinct emotions they were not categories of related sub emotions let's say they were all distinct singular emotions and there was no overlap so today we know that that, that that's wrong and everything else i just said before that was also also wrong <laughs> No, Basically, history, Darwin's, Darwin's entire theory, uh, we, we've discovered in, over the last 20 years, uh, is it was wrong. It, it's intuitively, seems intuitive, and it has, it's not that it has no kernel of truth in it, it's some, in some vague way, in, uh, in, in some uh, fuzzy way, it, it has some truth in it, but it's not really right. For example, I'll just give you an example of what I mean by fuzzy truth. Take his uh, pronouncement that there's six basic emotions. Today, we we look at many, many more than six. And, and those may be very important emotions for survival, but there's awe, there's embarrassment. We consider homeostatic emotions like hunger, for example, as an emotion. Um, there's jealousy, there, there's shame, guilt. We look at many, many more than, than that. Um, also, take fear. Uh, that's one of his, uh, the emotions that he defined as a basic emotion. But today we know that fear is not just one emotion. If we each introspect a little bit, you might imagine that your fear, as you stand on the, perhaps the edge of a, of a cliff looking down is maybe different from the fear that you'd have if a bear is coming at you or you, tur you look to the right and a truck is barreling down on you or, or there's a scorpion on your arm or whatever. But we can actually go further in science and say, not only does that feel different, we can look in your brain now and we can see that it really is different, uh, those kinds of fears. There are different types of fear. There's one interesting experiment that showed that uh, the fear, they, they put a, a tarantula, while a person was having her brain image, they put a tarantula on her arm and they studied the, the fear. And then they also uh, basically waterboarded her in, in, the, in the scientist's own way. Uh, but they made her feel that she was uh, suffocating uh, by adjusting the carbon dioxide in the air she was breathing. And the fear of suffocation uh, was different. And they could see in the brain, one, for example, involved the amygdala and the other didn't. So in fact, this person that they were experimenting on uh, had, didn't have an amygdala so that she didn't feel the fear from the scorpion, but she felt the fear from the suffocation because it doesn't involve the amygdala. So we know that, that there's different kinds of fear. And if you look at fear as compared to anxiety, it's not so easy to draw the line. It can be, there's a kind of a fuzzy line between them. So this whole idea that you can, that, that, that the emotions Darwin named are unitary and separate is, is, is also not true. It's not true that they have a certain specific place in the brain that's more distributed. And, and it's not true that, that, that the rational mind is separate and superior to emotion. They work together. So I do want to, I mean, I'm a former neuroscientist myself, nothing would give me more pleasure than to, to dig inside the brain. But before we go there, I just wonder, you know, 
do we do we think that the way that Darwin conceived of emotions was a product of his gender and of his class and of his culture and of his time? And that we've kind of managed to dissociate the study of emotion from that now. I don't quite mean, you know, uh, multiple words for snow, but do we do we think of emotion and the categorization of emotion as being universal across all cultures, uh, languages, um, classes, races, genders, and so on now? Or would you say that uh, it's still something where to understand it fully requires an understanding of specific culture and cultural difference? I think uh, most neuroscientists would agree that we all have the same apparatus for emotion and have the same emotional uh, experiences to a certain extent, but there are certainly differences in how we in our cultures and languages view emotions and categorize emotions. So there are some languages where there's no word for sad, or I think we're sad and anger are the same word. There's only one word for those two. And there's other emotions, other languages that have words for emotions that we don't have words for. Uh, the, my favorite example is, was the an emotion that was described as the exhilaration of uh, participating in a head, head hunting expe expedition. Uh, you don't mean recruitment, you mean <laughs> Yeah, I know, I mean in the wild, right. And um, right. so um, uh, th th there are, the, the, the way to look at it is that the, your brain has all these functional states and experiences and they're and, and it really has what William James said an infinite number of, of emotions but if you really look at each one so specifically that, that really each experience could be considered distinct but uh, in describing it we it's useful to have categories to talk about and it's natural because there are certain that ones that are very similar to other ones and I, I view it as the way we name colors in the rainbow the rainbow is a spectrum from a certain frequency up to a certain higher frequency from red to violet, or blue, violet. And we pick out some spaces in there and, and call them color, red, red, orange, or tur turquoise or whatever. And other uh, countries or cultures that uh, if they're isolated from us might pick out other ones. And the, the, the names we give them don't really matter. It's just a, it just helps us talk about them. Now, you, you mentioned Darwin's interest in emotion uh, based in his interest on ev of evolution. And clearly, we don't want to get into the mistake of thinking that we are the most evolved creature. But I, you might think if that was your interest, that uh, as, as we uh, as mammals evolved and primates and so on, uh, emotions would arise quite late in that process. But I know in your book, to me, quite surprisingly, you're describing some really unsophisticated organisms and even bacteria as, as having behaviors which can be understood as emotional. Can, can you explain uh, what you mean really for uh, about a bacterial emotion? Is that in any way the same as ours or is it just a metaphorical link? You know, wh where do you think our emotional world really starts or is it truly shared with all living things? Well, ev evolution tends to reuse things so uh, if you see uh, a hummingbird uh, flying around, it, it has wings, so do fruit flies, which are a much more primitive creature. Uh, and if you look even on the biochemical level, there are reward, there are chemicals that work in your brain for reward system, then you can find them in flatworms uh, too. So what, your, what evolution does is it takes whatever it has and it, rather than starting over and say, let's build something more sophisticated, it tweaks things. And a lot of the things are carried on. So we find in, in animals that uh, animals all the way down that we can see, well, I wouldn't say all the way down that we've studied, all the way down to fruit flies have emotions. And there's some very interesting experiments on fruit fly emotions. That doesn't mean they have the same conscious experience of emotion. They, I, they, I doubt that they do. And it doesn't even mean that they have the same emotions. I don't know if they have feel awe or jealousy but we, we, we can find that there are certain emotions such as fear that we can study and, and, and they have that, that emotion in fruit flies has some of the same properties that it has uh, in humans and, and, and the same uh, biochemical uh, or neurotransmitters being involved. Now, when you go down to uh, non-animals such as bacteria, I, I talked about not really emotion in bacteria, but something called core affect. And core affect is, is some another phenomenon phenomenon or quality of, of, of experience that we have that's 
a step more primitive than emotion. And it, it, it probably evolved, uh, that it evolves before emotion for sure. And emotion evolved from that, but we still experience that. Let me tell you what that is. A core affect. It's a core affect just for those of us that are, so affect is, yeah. Uh, sort of feeling in a sense and core in a sense what, what do you mean by core really? well core means it, 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 uh, the, uh, the term would be in this case would mean basic uh it, it what it is is uh, the human has a tremendously close connection between mind and body this is something that people had been saying for a long time in certain circles uh, but scientists have now been studying that and finding more and more that that's a very amazing connection between the, the mind and the body. And one of the things that the mind is always doing is so-called taking the temperature of the body, but by temperature, I mean more general metaphorical sense, the condition, measuring the condition of the body. So, uh, you know, are you, are you in a good homeostasis that you're, you, you're just chugging along and everything's fine, or is there a problem? Are you hot or cold, hungry, or are you thirsty, tired, sick? your body is constantly checking in with itself and, and it, it creates this concept or this measurement called we call core affect, which has two dimensions. It has, it's either positive or negative and it can be strong or weak. So, so when you, when you just think about what's my core affect, just think about how do I feel in, in a very basic way right now? Do I feel relaxed or energetic? Do I feel negative or positive? And that's, that's your core affect. And so in the book, I talked about the, the roots of that, which is even in bacteria, we can find that bacteria respond in that in, in, in a similar way, depending on the, what their current environment is. So we find the roots of a lot of uh, the feelings that we that we experience go all go back very far in evolution. And I think you argue, and I suppose this begins to become interesting, you know, throughout the book about the purpose of of uh, emotion now you can think about evolutionarily you know what's what's the fitness that it confers but but in a sense you 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 seem to suggest that the benefits that emotion even if it's realized in different biological ways by different creatures uh, the purpose of it is is connected for the two so why, why don't we why don't we have a shot at that what what do you think emotions are for if they you know so most of the animal world or even the uh, living thing world, at least if you look at beings, organisms that move, um, they, they, they work on a uh, trigger response uh, method. We might call that in, in, in higher animals, a fixed action pattern or autopilot um, or um, stimulus response. So that happens where uh, a moth, is you show you turn on a light the moth flies toward it it's, it, it's always going to do the same thing it was programmed uh, to do that by evolution for whatever reason and, and um and most animals behave that way if you um you know light a fire you withdraw your hand or uh it, it, animals tend to have a, a huge encyclopedia of triggers that cause certain responses and and they can get through life uh, that way pretty well um, sometimes it does it, it looks like they're exhibiting a more sophisticated behavior and actually they're really not let me just give one example of a of a goose sitting in, in the nest and an egg falls out she'll take the egg and she'll bring it back into the nest with her neck it looks like loving um, behavior of a loving mother oh there's an egg on the side of my nest i'm going to save this baby and bring it back in but researchers have found they can put a softball there, baseball there, and it'll it'll do that. They can put a, a, a crinkled up coffee can there; it'll do the, it'll do the same thing. It's not really a motherly love; it, it's an automated behavior that that she'll bring anything that's right there that's somewhat similar into the nest. And that kind of behavior works great for animals. And what I just said illustrates where it doesn't work, which is if you're in a new, in a novel or an altered situation that, that, that evolution hasn't prepared you for, like a, a, a pesky scientist putting a coffee can next to your nest. So then things don't work. Um, so humans have uh, more sophisticated possibilities for, for reacting. We all do that actually too, as you know, what if you're, let's say you're, if you drive to work and you have a certain path you drive every day, you pretty much do it mindlessly. And sometimes I would There's find good studies that, to show that, yeah, that you actually lose all sense of time and, and can't recall any details of the journey, assuming nothing exceptional or indeed emotional happens uh, in, in a driving sense. 
Yeah. And I would sometimes when I had my office at Caltech, I'd be, and I'm going to someplace that's not Caltech, but the first few turns are the same route. I would end up at Caltech because I didn't, I was just kind of on my autopilot. So we have a lot, and there's interesting studies of how that works in social realm too. People reacting, for example, to people asking for money on the street is very automated. So um, people who are asking for money, if they ask for like 37 cents, if they say, hey, hey man, can you, spend can you spare 37 cents? They get more money than people who just say, can you spare some money generically? Because the 37 cents kind of throws you out of your autopilot and makes you really consider whether you want to give this person some money. And then the answer is more often yes than otherwise. So, but we also have other ways. The corner from the Royal Institution who's actually read your book, Leonard. I, I think I've, I've, <laughs> I've, I've, he's encountered it. So we have also though our, 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 our rational mind that can help us uh, m make decisions. And it does that with emotions. And here's how, uh, what, emo what emotions do to that trigger response uh, that makes it more sophisticated. There is a trigger. So uh, let's say you see a bear, that's the trigger that would trigger an, an, another animal either to freeze or to run automatically without any, uh, any possibility of thinking it over. But to a human, it triggers an emotion, fear. Fear puts your mind in a certain mental state. In this case, the mental state is to pay very much attention to uh, sensory, certain sensory input, your, your vision and your hearing get more, uh, become better. You'll, you'll be more conscious of things in your environment that would have gone over your head and not registered otherwise. Uh, your, your, um, your feelings of, let's say, hunger disappear like that. You focus on, can I run and where can I go? And, and it automatically puts your, that logical processor I talked about, it puts it in a fear state where it's going to pay certain uh, um, higher attention to certain things and less attention to other things. Then that processor, your rational mind works within that context and decides on the action. And then you run <laughs> or you don't run, or maybe you climb a tree. I don't know, whatever you do, maybe you pull out your, your gun and hopefully just fire it in the air and the bear runs away. But you do something like that. But it, it, putting this extra layer in, which has to do with emotion and rationality, uh, gives you that, that uh, possibility of a more nuanced response, a more adaptive response, so that if, some, if, the, if the trigger happens and it's not the one that evolution has programmed you precisely for, you can still find an optimal solution. That can buy you out of that. Now, look, I mean, when I started doing neuroscience at the beginning of the 1990s, in a sense, the neuroscience, well, the world of the study of the brain was divided into two camps. There were what you might call the brains in vats guys. I was a brain in vat guy. I sort of studied brains in a not quite disembodied state, but in, a, in the context of a creature that wasn't doing very much. And then there were the behaviorists um, and they looked at behavior and they regarded the, the head as a kind of black box. The classic joke, Leonard, and, and block your children's ears, folks, if you're listening, but two behaviorists in bed and one says to the other, that was great for you. How was it for me? Right. So <laughs> the, you know, the, the, they, they didn't care what was going on inside the head and in their own heads. They were only interested in behavior. And this meant that many things which we now think of as being at the core of the most interesting parts of neuroscience, the new science that you describe, like emotions, for example, uh, were outside the realm of neuroscience. And gradually over the last couple of decades, two to three decades, the two, the behaviorists and the neuroscientists uh, have br brought themselves together. We've started to think about embodied minds, so minds that are in bodies, whether bodies and the feelings of that are important. And we've had this extraordinary wealth of, of neuroscientific imaging techniques, particularly. You referred earlier to being able to see which bit of the brain is doing what, and you weren't just about dissection there. You're talking about living, breathing people and seeing the areas. So can you give us a couple of insights into what the being able to look inside the head has done for the study of emotion? Well, so as you described it, psychology, uh, or early, that aspect of early neuroscience uh, really studied behavior, which made it, the, the, the experiments that you could do were experiments in the lab and, and watching how people behave, or if you were lucky, you could, uh, or if you were clever, you would maybe find some uh, real life experiments that you could do. But it was hard to tell, uh, to, it, it was hard to be sure of what's going on or to even define the, I think the terms or the phenomenon that were happening. When you can see inside the head and see what processes are happening in the brain, 
uh, it, it really allows you to have a much deeper understanding of the behavior that's happening because you can see is there a commonality between behavior X and behavior Y, or are they totally different processes in the brain? If, if, if they're the same processes or, or similar amongst different people, they must be related. And it kind of helps you to form the concepts and the roadmap of the behavior by kind of looking under the hood. And um, for example, I wrote about wanting versus liking. Uh, and uh, people used to think, didn't think there was a difference between wanting and, and liking. And we, we like what we want, we want what we like. Uh, and that kind of One makes sense. I, I like but then uh, 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 Kent Barrage noticed that you can, you can separate them. So you can, there you can create circumstances where a rat uh, will, will, will want something that it doesn't like. In other words, it will go and eat it, even though it, doesn't, it, it makes a face like it doesn't like it. Or it can make a face like it loves something, but it won't move to eat it. And so he, he saw that you could differentiate wanting and liking, that they're two separate things which was a, a brilliant observation to make, but it was by going into the brain and seeing that there's actually different pathways for these and what are the neurotransmitters involved that you could really nail down, yeah, there's something real there. Uh, it's not just, uh, let's say, some weirdness in this particular experiments in the rat or what, you know, you, you, you really know, oh, there's something concrete here. Now let's study how that works in humans. And you could, uh, they connected that to people because it, it's always a problem to say, I observe this in rats. Does it does it work in people? And um, you have to study that. And and they they found a person who was having electrodes stuck into his brain um, for epilepsy. And and they and they and and it was in that area. And they could see that same phenomenon happening when that was stimulated. So that really makes to me I, what I say is it turns psychology into a hard science. That's what neuroscience did. Okay, but so hard and soft, and again, you know, we're talking to a former physicist, so you're always going to have prejudices about what's hard and what isn't, and the neuroscientists think that their stuff is harder than the psychologists. But I do want to return to the comment that you made earlier about agreed terms between researchers, um, and, and, and to contrast again with respiration, right? So respiration, we know how to label the parts, we know what they do, we know their functional relationships, we needed to kind of dig in a little bit into the biology to get that. But my question or my concern, I wonder what your observation has been from the outside. We're gathering tons and tons of data. I mean, there are thousands of groups studying and, and tens of thousands of brain scanners in operation around the world, data being accumulated at massive rates. Um, and we can find more and more facts about emotion. We can label and understand more and more emotions. But are we reaching anything like a, a theory, a, a unified um, uh, account of the function of emotions based on the neuroscientific observations, or are we just labeling more and more areas and more and more phenomena? No, what was your sense idea, as you went through the field? I think this idea of the emotions as a functional state of an of a information processor is really moving in that, is in that direction. And the studies that they do, especially on animals and on uh, fruit flies and primitive animals, uh, where, where, where in, in a sense the apparatus is much simpler, are, are really revealing about uh, the, the function and nature of emotion. So I think we are making progress, but it's, it, you know, it's slow, it's a field that's, uh, um, and it's, well, I shouldn't say infancy if it's 20 years old, but it's a new, relatively new field. And, and the whole, actually the whole field of brain science is, is in, I could say in its infancy. Uh, my friend uh, who got me interested in neuroscience and at first, uh, Christoph Koch, who's an eminent neuroscientist, he used to be at Caltech. Uh, uh, he, he, he likened the state of uh, brain science to uh, Faraday uh, in the early 1800s and his understanding of electricity, which was just the rudiments, you know. Uh, and, and it took uh, from there about 60, 50 years to, to really come up with a good theory of it and and that and the brain is much more complicated than a few wires with uh, currents going through them, you know. So, so, so uh, Faraday, as you know, dear, dear dear friend and former director of the of the Royal Institution, and, and certainly a great experimentalist, not as it were particularly thought of as a theoretician. Let me ask you: um, the book, and we'll come to the book in a moment, but the book does contain many personal stories of your own life um, and your own family. Um, do you think that the the new science uh, of feelings? It, uh, can help individuals? Uh, do you think that understanding the insights which scientists have gained can help us to manage our own emotions, uh, to understand our own emotional profile better and, you know, to, to make us, as it were, happier humans? Do you think that 
this theoretical knowledge can help us. Yeah, that was one of my motivations for writing the book. And well, first, there, there is a whole chapter on emotion regulation, which I, I find uh, I found very useful when I was learning it to apply in my own life. But more generally, do you still apply it? I mean, oh, yeah, actually, I apply it all. Yeah, the, yeah, it, it, yeah, it, it's uh, it, it's not necessarily something that I didn't occasionally apply, but it, learning about it specifically and reading about it and reading how it works really made me go. Yeah, now it's very much in the top of my consciousness, the different different methods. And not only that, but but it's been shown that emotional intelligence is very is very useful for someone to thrive, that the people who have higher emotional intelligence as opposed to, say, IQ uh, do better at work in industry as leaders and they're happier in the relationships. Uh, so I'm hoping that the book provides that for people, a higher degree of emotional intelligence by knowing uh, what what's behind your thinking, what's influencing you, uh, where your emotions are coming from and how to control them. And I have a chapter on profiling your emotions where you can take uh, what the psychologists call inventories and just see about your tendencies, let's say toward anger or toward aggression or toward happiness. And you can understand a little more uh, what, where your own personal, uh, where you stand, because although we all have the same emotional apparatus, we were raised differently and, and, there's, and there's individual variations. So some of us have tendencies towards some emotions more than, than, than towards others. So by learning all this about yourself and just as important about other people, how to understand and read other people, that increases your emotional intelligence. And I think that's very important in today's world. I mean, do you want to give us an example? An example? I mean, again, people should buy the book if they want to do, do it in detail, but of, of a kind of drill or of a practice which you yourself have done more of uh, uh, as a result of the study that you've done, because it, it's not always the case, is it, that, that scientists who study things, you know, are happier, you know, as a result of that. In science, at least, we'll come to you as a writer in a minute, but, you know, there is often, you'd say, well, that works fine in theory, but, you know, how, you know, how in practice. Can you give us an example of something which you've actually put into practice? In oh, yeah, well, okay. I mentioned that I live in Los Angeles. Uh, that probably tells most people that I drive a lot. Uh, and the driving here is pretty aggressive uh, compared to, I mean, maybe every city they say, oh, they're too aggressive. It's pretty aggressive here. And you'll find that you're on the freeway and you get cut off a lot. Uh, in some towns, people stay in their lanes and they leave a certain distance between cars. And here that doesn't seem to be a concept. <laughs> so you're driving and somebody will just cut you off. And what really annoys me is they cut me off and they're going slower than me. So they managed to get in front of me, but now I got to slow down. But, you know, that tends to make people angry. And there have been conflicts uh, over such things right here. And and that's a natural tendency because your brain goes, the guy's an ass. He this is respecting me. He's being, I don't know, taking something. I don't know what he's taking. He's not really doing anything bad. You have to understand that you're just moving back 30 feet. It's no tragedy, but it angers you because you feel like it's uh, someone butt in line and that's just something you naturally rebelled against. Well, it, what I find, I, I use something called a reappraisal. So reappraisal is a method of emotion regulation where I, whereby you look at a situation that you appraise, that you looked at in a certain way that led to a certain emotion and you take a different spin on it. Now it's important that the spin be realistic. You can't just uh, make up something you don't believe, but find something that you do find plausible and, and look at it that way. So I tend to think that person's in a huge hurry. That person's going home to pee. They can't hold it anymore. Or that person Oh, by the way, both of which have happened to me, <laughs> or that person's oblivious. That happens to me a lot. I tend to be oblivious. Didn't even know I was there perhaps. And when I think of that person that way, instead of being the ass who's, who's elbowing his way in, suddenly I'm not really angry anymore. I might even be sympathetic and go, oh, I hope he makes it before he has an accident <laughs> or whatever it is. Okay. So, um, so you're a better driver as a result. I'm a better driver work. as a result of that. Yeah. And I'm a better, not just a better driver, I'm in a better state of mind because I take away, I diffuse that negative, unpleasant anger and I turn it into a, a bemusement or, or just, um, you know, indifference. <laughs> there are going to be some questions. I mean, already we're seeing them on the chat and we'll come to them in a moment, but I do want to zoom out a little bit just because I find the process by which you've reached, you know, the stage of enlightenment and knowledge uh, uh, so interesting. I mean, you were originally uh, a physicist. Um, 
Uh, talk to me about the writing about science piece. I don't know, you know, you've done it both on your own and with others, notably with Stephen Hawking. Uh, you've collaborated with Deepak Chopra, Steven Spielberg. What's the process of collaborative writing with people who aren't scientists like? Because you, you come from a scientific discipline, you have a scientific cast of mind. Do you find it frustrating writing with people who don't? What, talk, talk to us about the different approaches. Well, first I'll say, uh, I, you know, I, I'm a theoretical physicist, so I, even though I, I'm at the university anymore, I, I continue to publish papers and do my research. So uh, and I find uh, that that's a passion of mine and it's part of me that will never go. And I think that's very important when you're writing, because that's the other part of me is writing. And I've done both of those since uh, my grammar school, third grade, fourth grade, I was, I could see look back and see both those paths you do the writing in the morning and the physics in the afternoons or how how rapidly do you switch between the domains do you wear a different uh, jacket or sit in a different chair how do, how do you separate it, it, sometimes it's writing in the morning and physics because you know I, I find that uh, and i wrote a book called elastic about where ideas and creativity comes from and, and there's different times that, that, that you're optimal for different parts of your brain and i for me uh, i can do physics like if i'm if i can't sleep I can get up at 12 at night and I'll work for three hours on a physics problem or something, or, you know, late afternoon, uh, somehow I'm, I'm calm enough to dive into the physics. In the morning, I feel more, uh, more creative and more open. So i and I, the writing goes better in the morning. So sometimes it's that, or sometimes it's one day versus another day, but I, 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 I I talked to Richard Feynman. I don't know if your listeners know him, but I, my first stint at Caltech, I had an office a couple of doors down from him, and and we became well, I mean, he's extraordinary. Died young, but most extraordinary physicist and, and and popularizer of physics as well. Must have been. Yeah, and we talked about this issue because I was right then in the beginning of my writing career and in my middle of my physics career, but I was in my twenties. I was very young, and, and um, you know, and and he said. Which, which, which is what I would say to, is an answer to your question is that, you know, um, there's a lot of commonality between physics and writing. You, you need for both to come up with creative and new ideas. And then you need to apply a certain craft to carrying them through. And one, it's mathematics. And the other one, it's using, it's using language. Um, but but they're, they're, in some sense, they're not, they're not that different. Now, that said, there are other senses, that, you know, in which, in which they are different, which is, the human aspect that you have to put into writing, the understanding of people's feelings and um, and also their reactions to your work. Whereas in physics, what people's uh, feelings and reactions don't, in essence, don't matter. There's uh, nature is going to tell you whether what you what, whether your physics is right or wrong. <laughs> Do you get the right answer? Does it describe the world? Whereas in in writing, eh, it's going to be the the the, the whatever. Um, the jury of uh, your peers, your your readers, the critics, or the marketplace, or whoever you pick to follow. <laughs> uh, but you know that that aside, that's you know there there are similarities and, and differences. And I found that writing with um, with people who are not scientists, uh, the, the difference is that they that, that they tend to have a less, a more intuitive and less analytic approach than, than me. And in my writing, I, I try to be creative and, and, and write, don't just write things that are, you know, textbook like and mathematical, far from, I try to be the opposite of that. Uh, and yet my approach to learning, to, to looking at what, what's the structure of my book, uh, w w you know, what, um, What's the pacing of my book? I, I get very, I get very analytical, whereas everyone else is just intuitive. And I'm, I'm going, yeah, it feels right, but let me see. How long are the stories? You know, and how Real long statistics. were the stories in my in my last book? Am I right? Am I getting verbose? Is this going to be, you know? So I actually, uh, I actually look at my books and other people's books in a very analytical way, as, as but also as well as the, I hope is a non-analytical, intuitive way. But I have that other layer where I tend to quantify and analyze things just to see if um, if I can learn anything that way. Now, you said that uh, you paraphrased Feynman as saying that, you know, it's your idea, your job to come up with the theories and then wait for the universe to prove them 
uh, right or wrong. There is a big part of your writing life where that isn't the case because you've written, obviously, for Star Trek and, and, and perhaps in the video game context where you're in a science fiction realm where anything, as they say, is possible. How have you found that process? Is it different to writing you know, about things that we believe to be true or that we think are true, writing things that we know are not? Well, science fiction is very, very liberating because you, you, it's, it's fun. For a physicist, it's a special, special fun because I don't just, when I'm writing science fiction, I don't, I don't just make up stuff. Uh, and I, I make up stuff that's plausible. <laughs> so so I'm, I get the excitement by going, wow, um, this would be really cool. And it's not forbidden by the laws of physics. <laughs> you know, it's like, so that for me, the, the only the other physicists would care about that, right, Leonard? I mean, you're, you know, the, 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 I mean, I guess a lot of physicists do like Star Trek, but I mean, you know, w- why would you care in reality? Just break some law, come up with a storyline yeah. that's impossible. <laughs> well, I think for drama, for, for literature or, or film, uh, right, you set up the world at the beginning. And if you're consistent with that, it's fine. If you're constantly making up new rules, then that's bad storytelling because then it's not interesting because anything can happen so why worry about the main character anything can happen and you know but it, with, it should be self-consistent but for me I go beyond self-consistent I want it to be consistent with the world and I think that there are people who who read books like that uh, certainly with, I think on Star Trek who who were concerned that um, who, who felt a satisfaction knowing that the stuff that we did wasn't absurd within where was an out of the range of of, of possible um I, I think there are people who who like that just like when they make movies sometimes they say well this is a movie from world war ii and it's completely historically accurate the uniforms are just right the the sound i remember when Spielberg made, yeah, yeah, the exactly. sounds of the bullet yeah. this is really how a bullet sounded when it penetrates you or when you're underwater you hear this and that who cares well people did care because they it gives it a certain you know panache to know that it's uh that it's realistic so so look my final question before we come with the audience is 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 of a much more personal nature and i feel that it's legitimate to ask because the book when people read it you will you'll find that there are very i would say moving very touching and very personal descriptions of your family members of the personal history of your family your mother and 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 so on and i wonder you know also you describe in it um some horrifying uh, examples from the Holocaust and, uh, you know, uh, pe- refugees and escape. And we're in a time now of world history where thing, you know, scenes which um, uh, we, we hoped would not be repeated in, in Europe are, are happening around us. Can you talk a little bit briefly about, you know, how you've come to understand yourself, you know, and, and, and your family better through this process? And and whether you think that this theoretical understanding of emotion and of your own life can give us some sort of compass to understand the more horrifying aspects of human behavior that, that we're witnessing right now. Well, I, I think that my experiences uh, with my parents do help me understand that uh, unfortunate and, <laughs> and the unfortunate existence of that sort of behavior, which has uh, persisted really. It's not, I mean, this is now happening in Europe, but it happens in different parts of the world all the time. Um, I should say for people who don't know, my, my, my uh, parents went through the Holocaust. My uh, mother lost her dear sister, whom she was very close to, and her um, father. And my father had uh, lost his whole family, siblings and parents, and also his wife and child. And he was in the, um, my mother ended up in a labor camp like in Schindler's List. And my father was in the underground uh, for a while and then ended up in the concentration camp. So, uh, you know, I grew up with all that as being very uh, real to me and uh, not just the uh, incidents and the history that happened and the fact that, gee, other people had things called cousins, you know, <laughs> or uncles and I didn't, what, what are those, you know? So, um, but also the baggage that my parents had that came from that. My mother was 16 or 18 when the war started. My father was 10 years older. And uh, so they, the, my upbringing was quite different from <laughs> most people's. And I've drawn on that in all my books. Uh, I seem to have, well, when I write a book uh, and I'm trying to illustrate a scientific point, I often start in with a story. I think stories are great. And either the story should be 
moving, compelling, or funny, or just interesting, or something. And of course, it should make the point I want to make. And um, and I find that I uh, each book finds several stories from my upbringing or from my parents' lives that uh, that fit that. So in this case, is to answer your question, I. Um, you know, I also, I, you know, I have to say, I should say that I lived in Germany uh, as well for several years and speak German. And so um, my understanding uh, from my parents, from living in Germany, from going through uh, the, our, our politics in the U.S. for the last five or six years, uh, I, you know, I, I, uh, I, I don't really see... Uh, I think I see fairly clearly what, what's happening. Uh, first of all, leaders, uh, the wrong leader can do such amazing harm, uh, can take the whole country and turn it upside down. And, uh, and then it can happen in a country as powerful as Russia with nuclear weapons is just super scary, right? Uh, the people, uh, the, the people, in a country can easily become deluded or um, follow, you know, a, 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 a very um, sad path. Uh, that's not as hard as it seems either, especially if they're uh, not happy and, and, and not, not thriving. And, you know, all the work that I've done in, in neuroscience and psychology and uh, including studying animal behavior you, you know, you really see that this is very unfortunate and sad for humans. And guess what? It's, it's kind of uh, not uncommon in, in, in other species and it's in our relatives and our primates. I, I'm a primatologist. Uh, I remember reading once uh, he said, uh, you put a um, hundred chimpanzees on a Boeing 747 in New York and you fly it and land it in Los Angeles. When you open the doors, there will only be one left alive. <laughs> So um, the, the behavior we're seeing is, is somewhat natural and unfortunate. And to me, the history is about overcoming some of those more base individualistic mm -hmm. aggression instincts and, and really emphasizing our social, our social instincts, which is also there very strong in humans, uh, cooperation, social, and kindness. But it, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think we're moving in that way as Michael Shermer's wrote the, the book about, um, I think it was called The Moral Arc about humanity progressing. I think we are progressing, but there's also uh, backslides that seem to be going through, for instance, right now.